in the previous few uh, lectures, we were talking about duality. And there are a few things that we have covered so far. So let me just quickly review what all things we have covered. The first thing is the definition of geometric multiplier. So mu star greater than or equal to zero is geometric multiplier if and only if f star equals to um, the Lagrangian of x comma mu star. So that was the definition of geometric multiplier. Then we talked about the dual problem we went through all the visualization lemma and so on when then we talked about the dual problem where if I have the problem of minimize fx such that hx equal to zero, gx less than equal to zero, you can construct a dual problem where you define q of lambda mu define the set D such that lambda in RM mu greater than or equal to zero such that well I have to be a bit more And then the dual problem is maximize lambda mu in D. And as an example of this dual problem, we had studied the case of linear programming problem so I have minimum of C transpose X such that AX is equal to B and X is greater than or equal to zero. The dual problem is max of B transpose lambda such that A transpose lambda is less than or equal to C. Okay, we also learned that the dual problem is actually a convex problem. So Q is concave function and we are taking maximization of a concave function and D is a convex set. So this is actually a convex problem. Which is a nice property of duality. Okay. The third thing we learned was weak duality theorem, which says Q star is less than or equal to F star. This is the weak duality theorem. And as you can see, the amount of assumptions needed for weak duality to hold is almost negligible. It literally holds under all situations, no matter whether F is con convex or concave or, you know, whatever, non-differentiable, doesn't matter whether X is discrete or not. 
It doesn't matter whether you have equality constraints or inequality constraints. You know, it just holds in all situations, weak duality theorem. Okay, in fact, uh, you know, of course, I, I don't expect you to be familiar with infinite dimensional optimization, but turns out that this also holds in infinite dimensional situations. So, so those of you who may be doing research in infinite dimensional optimization, uh, it would be cool to know that weak duality theorem holds even in the most general situations. Okay, then the fourth thing we learned was no duality gap implies that set of geometric multipliers is equal to the set of optimal dual solutions. It also turns out that if you don't have an optimal dual solution, then there will be no geometric multiplier for the original problem, even though you may not have a dual, even though there is no duality gap. Of course, if there is a duality gap, then the set of geometric multipliers is empty. Let me just write it. Okay, so if there is a duality gap, then there are no geometric multipliers. We learned about the saddle point theorem which said that L of X mu star, no, L of X star mu, X star mu star. Okay, so X star mu star is a saddle point of the Lagrangian. Uh, along the X axis, if you minimize that mu star, the optimal point is uh, X star itself, the optimal point itself. Whereas along the mu axis, if you're maximizing at X star, then the optimal mu is mu star. So at this point of time, are there any questions on whatever we have covered so far in terms of the theory? Any clarifications on what we have done in the previous lectures or any questions on some of these topics that we have covered so far? Okay, so if there are no further questions. What I'm going to do today is we'll talk about convex problems where and, and identify conditions under which there is no duality gap. I'm not going to be covering any proofs in today's class. I'll just state what the theorem is so that you can, if you're interested, you can look up the proof in the book. The proofs are pretty long and tedious, uh, but uh, but it's it's but those are important proofs, but I'm not going to cover it in the class due to lack of time. Okay, so that's our next question. Um, but before that, I want to, I think there was a question in the previous class that I wanted to answer. Let me just answer it here. So the question, if I remember correctly was, if there is no duality gap, 
q star equals to f star but does it imply that geometric multipliers exist and the answer to this question is no uh, it will only exist if there is an optimal dual solution gm exists only if there are optimal dual solution Okay, so you could have a situation where there are no optimal. So even though there is no duality gap, turns out that there are no optimal dual solution and therefore geometric multipliers do not exist. Okay, let me illustrate this with an example from the book. The example is as follows. We want to solve the following problem. I want to minimize x such that x square is less than or equal to zero. X is in R. Okay, so this looks like a parabola. Okay, and by inspection, you can see that the only hyperplane so this is this 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 just this line is the set s this is the set s just this particular line and this this thing goes all the way to uh, minus infinity and this thing goes all the way to plus infinity so as you can see the only uh, uh, hyperplane such that s is in the positive half space is a vertical hyperplane which is the y axis okay so therefore there is no geometric multiplier here but let's let's try to see it mathematically so the first thing i want to know is what is f star here what's the value of f star Someone wants to give it a shot. What's the value of F star here? Sorry, someone said something. Uh, X equals zero. Zero, yeah. Okay, so there is only one feasible point, which is uh, when X is equal to zero, and therefore that's the only optimal, I mean, that's the optimal solution. Uh, let's try to find out what Q of mu looks like. So that is inf over X in R, the Lagrangian of X comma mu. So that is inf of X in R, X plus mu X square. Remember mu is non-negative. What's the infimum here? Let's look at two cases. One is where mu is greater than zero. Sorry, mu is equal to zero. And then the second one is mu is greater than zero. So what happens when mu is zero? What is the value of infimum? Negative infinity. Yeah. 
So when mu is equal to zero, you have infimum of x, which is negative infinity. Okay, what happens when mu is strictly positive? It requires a little bit of calculation. Let's try to do it. So when mu is strictly positive, this is actually a convex problem. So I can solve it by taking the first derivative and setting it equal to zero. So I have two mu x plus one equals to zero. So x star is equal to minus one over two mu. And so if I substitute it in here, So what do I get? Minus one over two mu plus mu times one over four mu square, which is equal to minus one over four mu. Okay, any questions so far? I think it's uh, pretty straightforward. Okay. Let's try to find out the set D. So D is just mu strictly positive because when mu is equal to zero, then the value of Q is minus infinity. So D is just Q greater than zero. Now what's the value of Q star? That supremum Q mu mu in D. What's the value Q star? So this, this, this term is negative. This term is less than zero for all mu, which is positive. But can it approach zero? What would the supremum be? for the Q function, someone wants to give it a shot. Would it not just be zero? It will be zero because I can let mu arbitrarily large and I can get as close to zero as I want. Mm -hmm. so therefore the supremum would be equal to zero. So this is actually equal to F star. Remember F star was also zero and Q star is also zero here. But it turns out that the supremum is actually achieved at infinity so therefore um, it's it's not a maximum and so there is no mu star no mu star or, or I should say no finite mu star this implies that there is no geometric multiplier for this problem So even though there is no duality gap, the problem is nice convex problem. As you can see here, objective function is convex, the constraint is convex. Turns out that there is no duality gap here, but it also has no geometric multiplier in this problem. Okay, so just because you don't have duality gap doesn't mean that there will be a geometric multiplier because you may not have a dual optimal dual solution. Uh, you may not have a geometric multiplier in those situations. Okay, I think this answers the question that was raised in the previous class.
And uh, we have considered several situations, one in which there is a duality gap. So in that case, there is no obvious, obviously there is no geometric multiplier there. We have seen situations where there is no duality gap and you can compute the optimal dual solution. So therefore, um, there is a, a geometric multiplier in that case. And we have seen a situation where there is no duality gap, but there is no optimal dual solution. Therefore, the set of geometric multipliers is empty. There are no geometric multipliers in that case. Okay. So with this in mind, um, let's move on to situations, uh, especially we, we are going to talk about convex problems where there is under certain conditions, there are no duality gaps. So let's try and understand what those conditions are without proofs. So the first situation I'm planning to, I'm going to consider is the following. I want to minimize a function fx such that x is in set capital X, ax, a1x equals to b1, a2x equals to, oh, a2x is less than equal to b2, and the set x is polyhedral which means the set X is given by X in Rn. A3X less than equal to B3. Okay, so as you can see, the constraints are all the uh, uh, linear constraints including the polyhedral constraint on the set capital X that also is a linear constraint on the, on the space of all X. And this is the convex problem that we will be considering. Okay. The theorem is as follows. So F star is finite. There's a whole bunch of assumptions here. X is polyhedral. F is convex over Rn. And this is the most important point. F has to be globally convex, not just in the domain, uh, in the feasible region, but you know, in the entire space of real numbers or the Euclidean space. Okay, under these assumptions, There is no duality gap and mu star exist. Or actually I should say lambda star mu star because you have both equality and inequality constraint.
we have seen this uh, an application of this result which is minimize c transpose x such that ax equal to b x greater than equal to zero right so we had considered this convex problem earlier c transpose x is globally convex ax equal to b is a equality constraint linear equality constraint x greater than equal to zero is a polyhedral set okay so all of these conditions are satisfied and in that situation there is no duality gap and uh, there will be a lagrange uh, a geometric multiplier in this situation um, it also turns out that geometric multiplier will be equal to lagrange multiplier in the case of convex problems okay any questions so far on this uh, particular result the proof is fairly uh, uh, i mean tedious and it follows from what is called farkas lemma uh, and the, it's given in the book so if you're interested in reading the proof of this particular result you can refer to the book it will take me like a couple of lectures to cover the proof of this result okay the most important thing again i want to emphasize in this particular theorem is that f has to be convex over the entire rn okay let's look at the second result which is slightly more general so i want to minimize f of x such that dx is less than equal to 0 x is in capital x and of course f is convex g is convex x is convex but we'll be a bit more precise when we write the statement of the theorem so the first obvious assumption f star is finite second assumption x is a convex set f g from x to r convex so you just want the functions f and g to be convex in the domain within the set x so outside of set x it may be non convex that's completely fine but within the set x it has to be a convex function and then there is this fourth condition that i want you to pay attention to which is called slater constraint qualification which is basically there is exist an x tilde in capital x such that g x tilde is strictly less than 0 well let me write it gj x tilde is strictly less than 0 for all j equals to 1 2 r and the result is the same as above under these conditions no duality gap and in this case mu star exists so geometric multiplier exists in this particular scenario
So there are, I mean, some of these assumptions are obvious, but the non-obvious part is the Slater constraint qualification, which means that there has to be a point in the convex set capital X such that all the inequalities are strict at that particular point. Okay, so GJ of X tilde is less than zero for all J. That's the Slater constraint qualification. We have seen one example of this particular fun this optimization problem. Let me write it here, which we just talked about. I want to minimize X such that X squared is less than or equal to zero. X is in R. So F star equals to zero is finite. Uh, X is in R. So X, this capital X is basically the entire real line, which is a convex set. F and G, both of them are convex functions. So all these three first three conditions are satisfied. What is not satisfied is the Slater constraint qualification. There is no X tilde such that X tilde squared is strictly less than zero, right? So this was the condition that wasn't satisfied by the optimization problem we just considered a few minutes ago. And therefore in that situation, there was, even though there was no duality gap, there was no mu star. So in this case, because of the Slater constraint qualification, we can show not only that there is no duality gap, but in fact, there exists a mu star, which is the geometric multiplier for this particular convex problem. Let me tell you, using the figure, how, what does it mean to have Slater constraint qualification This is my GX, this is my FX, and I'm going to define my set capital S. This is my set capital S, which is equal to GX comma FX. And what the Slater constraint qualification says is there is a point that there is a point X tilde such that your GX tilde is strictly less than zero. So you have some part of the set which is on the negative side of the vertical axis, well, of the horizontal axis uh, or on the, so some part of the set S has to be on the left side of the vertical axis. So there has to be something on the left side of the vertical axis. Okay, so that's the meaning of Slater constraint qualification. In the case of the other optimization problem that we talked about, if you recall, the set S there was a parabola like this. And so we didn't have anything any part of set S was not in the, on the left side of the vertical axis. And that's why it didn't satisfy the Slater constraint qualification. I'm just writing SCQ for Slater constraint qualification. Okay, so two fairly broad classes of convex problems we, um, we have discussed uh, just now. One in which all the constraints are polyhedral in nature, in which case, if the function is convex over the entire Euclidean space, there exists a there is no duality gap and there exists an optimal dual solution. And the second problem is inequality constraint problem, um, such that 
uh, Slater constraint qualification is satisfied, in which case there is no duality gap and mu star exists. Okay, let me make it smaller. Any question on these two settings? So this is setting number one, and then the setting number two. Both these, uh, both the um, the proofs for both these theorems are there in the book. So please refer to it if you're interested in the proof. Uh, they are fairly long and tedious, but I have covered it in in one of the previous classes. So you might be able to find the video um, uh, in the previous year's lecture, if if in case you are interested in watching the proof of this two theorem. Okay, looks like there are no questions on this. So that kind of ends our discussion about duality. Uh, what we have done so far is understood the difference between, so the Lagrange multiplier is a very specific concept which requires differentiability of the function and, and uh, having uh, so, so remember that in the definition of Lagrange multiplier, we required things like regularity of the point uh, x star and then the differentiability of the function and so on, differentiability also of the uh, constraints. So h and g functions were also supposed to be differentiable. Whereas in the context of geometric multiplier, we have absolutely no such constraint. The function could be whatever, your g or h could be whatever, it need not be differentiable. The set X could be a discrete set or it could be a continuous set, it doesn't matter. And yet we can, we can study the geometry of the set capital S and come up with interesting results about duality gap and weak duality theorem and so on. All of which serve, serves as a powerful tool for developing more complicated algorithms for solving very large scale combinatorial optimization problems. But unfortunately, there is no course uh, currently at OSU where you will get to see all those complicated combinatorial like solutions to combinatorial optimization problems. How do you come up with algorithms for solving those combinatorial optimization problems? Uh, but nonetheless, I think the stuff that we have talked about in this class so far builds enough background so that you can Pick up, a, pick up a book on say integer optimization methods or large scale optimization methods or primary dual methods and try to read it, read the book, understand the algorithms and potentially implement it in your uh, research or your career ahead. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so the next topic that we'll be talking about is for the rest of the semester is dynamic optimization al algorithms. Or I should actually say optimization of dynamic systems. Okay, so so far we were talking about optimization for static systems. So you, you were given a static optimization problem and we studied different types of algorithms for solving static optimization algorithm. In some instances, we understood the convergence properties of those static optimization algorithms. Yeah. So one thing you should know is in most situations you can arrive at the convergence result uh, using Banach contraction mapping theorem, um, you know, but but of course there are many more general tools available to establish convergence of all the algorithms that we have studied in for static systems. Now our focus exclusively is on dynamic systems, and and uh, uh, now there is a time component, so the system is evolving dynamically over time. So now you have a time component, you have a 
space component and the system has some dynamical equation which allows it to evolve over time. And you want to appropriately control the system in such a way that you obtain some desired behavior from the system itself. So you can think of examples of dynamic systems would be, of course, vehicles. And I know many people from Center for Automotive Research are taking this class. So, so they, they are all going to be working on dynamic systems, aircrafts, So this is manned or unmanned aircrafts. You have oil and natural gas. You have chemical plants. We have biological systems. So, you know, a lot of the stem cell research. So let's say you are, you have stem cells and you want the stem cells to grow into certain specific cells of the body. Uh, the question would be, how do you control the growth of the stem cells so that you can get the desired, the end result would be a desired tissue of the body. How can you get that? So that's something people study in biological systems. Or for instance, there are insulin pumps and the question would be to measure the blood glucose level and determine how, many, how much insulin should be pumped into the bloodstream. Um, so that is a biological system and you want to control, optimally control the biological system to get some desired behavior for the overall system. So there are plenty of examples in today's world uh, where there is a dynamic system and you want to optimally control the dynamic system. Okay, so you want to optimally, with respect to some set criteria, you want to optimally control the dynamic system. Okay. Now, whenever we talk about dynamic system, we need to first understand the concept of state of the dynamic system. Okay. And so the rest of this class, uh, I'm just going to talk about states. Now, of course, many of you may have read papers or have looked at books or looked at systems and uh, the description of the state would be already provided as part of the description of the system. But when you are faced with a new problem, one of the first thing that you need to do, so when you're faced with a new dynamic system and someone asks you, uh, can you give me an algorithm to optimize this system? The first question you need to ask yourself is what is the state of the system? The first question, this is the question number one. What is the state of the dynamic system? And in particular, the first thing we would like to understand is, uh, how do we define state of a dynamic system? And that brings me to the definition of the state of a dynamic system. So a variable, a vector, xt, well, let me call it a sequence of vectors. Sequence of vectors xt, t equals one to capital T, is the state of a dynamic system if xt plus one depends only on xt and action ut. Oh, I haven't defined the action yet. Well, let me define what the action is. So I have a system
and I'm giving it a set of inputs. U1 to U capital T. So capital T is the, the time horizon of the system. So I'm giving it inputs U1 to UT and I'm getting some output. Okay, and I want some desired output. And the question is to identify what the state of the system is so that you can make sure that the output is actually desired, is, is following a desired behavior uh, of the system. Okay, so So this is how you would define the state of a dynamic system. So a sequence of vectors is a state of the system if xt plus one depends only on the past state and the input ut, u at time t. Okay. Now let's look at a specific example of a dynamic system, uh, which would be a vehicle. The inputs would be accelerator and brake. Okay, typically these are the two inputs. Well, actually there is steering as well. So let me add steering as well. So we have three inputs here, accelerator, brake and steering. Okay, at every point of time T, I am going to either press the accelerator, I'm gonna press the brake or, um, and at the same time I may be steering the vehicle left or right, or just keeping it steady. Okay, so that's the set of inputs that I'm applying over period of time. And I want the output to have to be, uh, let's say a safe driving strategy. So I want to have a safe uh, driving distance with, with respect to all cars. All other vehicles on the road. I mean, typically you, it's not just having safe distance with other vehicles, but it's also obeying all the traffic laws, you know, stopping at the traffic light, uh, keeping away from pedestrians or stopping the car if you see a pedestrian on the road and things like that. Okay, or if there are obstacles on the road, let's say if there is a deer on the road or if there is a squirrel on the road or if there is an eagle on the road, you know, all of these situations have happened with me before. Uh, you basically have to stop the car and let that obstacle go away. So it's not part of the rules of the road, but you still don't want to say bump into the deer or bump into a squirrel or whatever while you're driving the vehicle. So there is some safe driving behavior. That's the desired behavior that you would like the car to follow uh, with these three inputs. And now I ask you, well, let me try to optimize my vehicle or, opt, or come up with a driving strategy um, so that I follow all the rules of the road and I also come up with a safe driving trajectory, okay? So suppose I pose you this problem, what do you think would you define as the state of the system? So what would be the XT vector formed of? What do you think? So, uh, so I know that the vector, so I know from my experience that the vector XT is actually pretty long, but I want you to try and identify what would the state of such a system be? Any thoughts? Speed. Distances to the other vehicles. Speed, uh, distance to other vehicles. 
nice what else Anyone else wants to take a stab at this problem? So the speed of your own vehicle, uh, distance to the other vehicles, what else? Let me add one more. So relative speed with respect to other vehicles so it's not just the distance that matters but also how quickly that distance is reducing or increasing based on the differential of the speed between your car and the other vehicle what else how about well, let me, I, I want you guys to, I mean, you can be wrong, but, but I want you guys to think about what would the state of this problem be? Uh, stopping ability. Stopping ability? Did you uh, say that? Like depending on road conditions. If I you're think, able okay, to stop that, like yeah, road conditions are good. That's a good point. So whether you have ice or snow or whatever, you know, water on the way on the road, then that would become part of the state. Okay, how about distance to traffic light? and stop signs. Okay. How about the state of the traffic light? So if, whether it's red or green, right? That's also part of the state because the next state would depend on the current state and potentially uh, no, to, so the traffic light is, of course, external disturbance, but it also depends on what the current state of the traffic light is. Okay. Um, I would also add distance to obstacles. I was once driving from Champaign to Chicago and somebody had thrown a garbage on the highway and I was driving at like 65 miles an hour on that highway. And there was a huge pile of garbage in the middle of the lane that I was driving in. So that was an obstacle and I didn't want to bump into the garbage. So I had to move my car to the other lane. So that was also a state. Okay, how about, let me add some more states and I want you to think about it and come up, come up with uh, a question that I'll ask after I write the state. So let's say temperature in Chicago and position of moon and I don't know, day or night or something, some, some, some other Okay, let, let's just keep it at, at this level. So you have like this, I have identified a bunch of states. Okay, and I'm sure you would agree that these states seem to be important variables. Uh, they really affect your driving abilities 
and your driving decisions, whether you want to swerve right, whether you want to stay in the same lane, whether you want to um, speed up or whether you want to brake. Actually, speed limit, road conditions like speed limit, that's also a state of the system. Okay, so all of these will affect your decision making. But these two states, I mean, they are still state because they change. Um, uh, I mean, the temperature of uh, Chicago in the next second is dependent on the temperature of Chicago at this moment, or the position of moon at next second depends on the position of the moon at this second. But there's something I'm sure you are a little bit uncomfortable about having these as part of as description of the state for this dynamic system. So I want you to come up with an answer about why would I not put these two things in the state description of this vehicle that I'm trying to design, whose goal is to be driving safely on the road and maintain distance with respect to other vehicles on the road and follow all the traffic rules and regulations. Okay, so I'll leave it at it in this particular lecture. I want you to think about it and you know, we'll have a discussion at the beginning of next class about why, what's the problem with these two state variables. Okay, with that, I end my lecture today. Um, if you have any questions, you can stick around. Otherwise, feel free to drop off and have a good evening.